talk of the town. The Boards, Noise on Wheels, by Michael Shulman. Times Square, on its best days, is a hive of controlled chaos where tourists, cabbies, actors, Elmos, and the naked cowboy manage a tenuous coexistence. A new element can upset the ecosystem. Witness the proliferation of music blaring pedicabs, which lately have turned from rare treat to swarm, some say scourge. I've seen pedicabs in the city for over 20 years, Tom Harris, the president of the Times Square Alliance, said the other day. He was near the TKTS booth amid the holiday throngs. Recently, the behavior has pushed it to a point where it's not an amenity, it's a detraction from the quality of life. Harris, trench coat, Brooklyn accent, has overseen a growing turf war between the bicycle-drawn carriages and the Broadway community. They congregate around theaters at the end of theater times. They almost block up the entire street. Their sound is blasting outside even before the show lets out, he said, and there's predatory pricing. I've heard stories of people paying hundreds of dollars to go a few blocks. Only a small number of pedicabs are licensed, he explained. Two days earlier, in a sting operation, the NYPD had seized 77 illegal pedicabs in Midtown. Curbside skirmishes are common. Last spring, the proprietors of Glass House Tavern on 47th Street complained on Instagram about the horde of pedicabs causing dangerous situations for pedestrians and being verbally abusive to our staff as the drivers waited for the musical six to let out next door. Glass House posted a sign warning tourists about the pedicab's $9 per minute rate. In apparent retaliation, the restaurant was besieged with negative reviews online. Noise is a big issue. The police raid came two weeks after the city councilman Eric Botker sent a letter to three city agencies reporting an uptick in complaints, in part because of amplified music that is frequently audible during performances, he wrote. Broadway actors have messaged him on Instagram about it. He urged stronger enforcement of existing regulations and possibly new legislation. If you're following the rules, I really don't have a problem, he said, but they shouldn't be audible during a performance. That's just not cool. The pedicab playlist can be jarring. The Hayes Theater, which recently housed the period farce The Cottage, set in the Cotswolds in 1923, is across the street from A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond musical, where pedicabs strategically blast Sweet Caroline. It's frustrating because sometimes that noise will take the audience out of the moment, Jim Joseph, who operates The Hayes, said. Outside Gutenberg, the musical... Pedicabs played spooky music on Halloween so loudly that Andrew Rannells and Josh Gad improvised jokes about it on stage. Last summer, while the comedian Alex Edelman was performing Just For Us, his solo show about Jewish identity, he could hear pedicabs' music from behind the stage wall. He recalled, Sometimes I'd be in a quiet moment in the show and hear... He broke into Alicia Keys, In New York, concrete jungle where dreams are made of. They were an omnipresent threat. The problem is acute at How to Dance in Ohio, a new musical at the Belasco with autistic cast members. We have worked very hard to make the show accessible for audience audiences who have sensory issues, so having them come out to this blaring wall of pedicabs is really detrimental, Fiona Rudin, a producer, said. One night she recalled an emotional scene in which an autistic pet store employee is berated by a supervisor was disrupted by a pedicab booming single ladies. Harris helped arrange barricades outside the Belasco, pushing the pedicabs across the street. We tried to get them to turn down the music and they just wouldn't comply, he said. A tinsel bedecked pedicab stopped at a light on 7th Avenue playing a dance remix of Jingle Bells at a reasonable volume. Harris was pleased to see a badge around the driver's neck. You're one of the few that are licensed, he said. It's not easy, the driver, Mustafa, said. He'd come to New York from Turkey 30 years ago and drove a taxi before the pandemic when he switched to a pedicab. This is an immigrant job, he said. But unlicensed drivers have hurt his business. He'd almost come to blows with one. I have two kids. First time I asked New York State for SNAP help. 
Another pedicab sped by, blaring Will Smith's men in black. Here's the difference. He's got no license, Harris observed. This is like a tale of two cities. Mustafa said that he was getting out of the pedicab game. He'd already sold two of his three bikes. I don't like this job, he said. It's too much hustle. Very bad environment. Personal History Published in the print issue of The New Yorker with the headline, The Long Way Adventures of a Teenage World Traveler Written by John Lee Anderson Narrated by Joel De La Fuente Please be advised this article contains adult language and discussion of topics that may not be suitable for children. When I was 12 years old in 1969, my family moved to Reston, Virginia. It was a planned community near Washington, D.C., a suburban utopia where CIA agents and foreign service officers like my father could raise their families. I hated Reston and hated living in the United States. We had stayed in northern Virginia for part of the previous year between stints in Taiwan and Indonesia. During our time there, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, one of the few times I saw my parents cry. While I was out selling I Have a Dream stickers in King's memory to support the Poor People's Campaign, a neighbor sicked his dogs on me. I ran away from home several times, and so my mother and father devised a solution for my restlessness. They sent me to stay for a year with an aunt and uncle in Liberia. I spent most of it ducking my chaperones to travel into the Liberian wilderness and around East Africa, and when the time was up, I told my parents that I didn't want to leave. I noted that a Swiss adventurer had passed through Monrovia on his way to crossing the Sahara by camel and had invited me to join him. My parents pointed out that I hadn't yet finished middle school. Crestfallen, I went back home. I got into more trouble as I entered high school, mostly for drugs. I did acid and pot like everyone else, but a girl once shot me up with heroin before archery class. Several kids I knew died from overdoses. After that, my parents decided to move again and began looking for a calmer place to live. My father took early retirement from his foreign service job, thinking he often said later that he needed to save me. But he and my mother were also trying to save their marriage, which had become increasingly strained during 20 years of moving around the world. My father had always been a wanderer, the kind of person who'd happily get from one place to another by taking a freighter. My mother a children's author who'd published her first book at 28, had put her work aside to follow him. On foreign service assignments, the two had lived in Trinidad, Haiti, El Salvador, South Korea, and Colombia before landing in Taiwan and Indonesia. Along the way, they'd assembled a family. My sister Michelle was born in Haiti, where she got inoculations from the embassy's recommended physician, Francois Duvalier, the future Papa Doc. Tina was adopted during the El Salvador years, and Mei Shan in Taiwan. My younger brother Scott and I were born in California between overseas postings. My mother chose our next destination, the pretty Victorian town of Lyme Regis on the English coast. Lyme Regis was famous for its cliffs and fossils, and for being the site of the 19th century drama that unfolds in John Fowle's novel The French Lieutenant's Woman. To me, it felt like a model train set. Everything was tiny, from the cars to the terrace houses where people lived, and the English had pale bodies, gray teeth, and odd habits. Even the children drank tea. To the locals, we were the exotics, a multiracial American family, and I was a boy who acknowledged no rules. For my family, this period of stasis didn't last long. At the end of the school year, my father loaded my brother Scott into a VW van and set off overland for India. My mother secured a teaching position at the University of Florida in Gainesville, invited by the Southern Gothic novelist Harry Cruz, and brought along my sisters Tina and May Shan. Michelle, who was four years older than I, had already left home, first living on the Kenyan island of Lamu, and then going to study in Nice. By the time my parents left, I had been kicked out of school in Lyme Regis, wild and undisciplined, the headmaster said, and sent to finish preparing for my A-level exams in the nearby city of Exeter. I was enrolled in an academy and set up in a rooming house run by an elderly couple. 
My housemates were a doughy white Rhodesian and a tall boy from Hong Kong. We were all foreigners, and therefore misfits, and we soon fell in together. On Friday evenings, if we were allowed out, we'd get fish and chips and go to the movies. Otherwise, we kept to a dull routine. The house had no central heat, and to stay warm at night, we had to feed chilling coins into tiny heaters in our bedrooms. Our meals ran to fried eggs and ham, liver and mash, and beans on toast. After supper, we were allowed to watch an hour of telly in the living room with our hosts in attendance. The landlady farted continuously. When I complained to the other boys about this habit, she ejected me for rudeness. I found a room in a communal student house, and between classes I spent hours jotting down ideas for expeditions. On a piece of paper headed with my notes on Chaucer and King Lear, I sketched an outline for a year-long voyage in which I'd buy a small dhow on the Persian Gulf and then sail to Madagascar and beyond. Next to a drawing of the dhow, I set out a goal for the expedition. Smuggle and trade, be a freelance pirate ship. I determined that I'd deal in guns and rare animals, but not in opium. Reading about the opium wars had convinced me that it was an evil drug. When my father returned from India, nearly a year on the road, he asked me what I wanted to do with myself when I had finished my exams. I told him that I wanted to join my sister Michelle. She was spending the early summer with the Kabye people of northern Togo on an anthropological expedition, and I had thought of nothing else since she went. I idolized Michelle. She was beautiful, brave, adventurous. She had gone to Woodstock, and now she was in Africa, the happiest place of my childhood. In letters, she had encouraged me to come to her village. I had it planned. I could hitchhike south through Europe, then catch a boat. My father gave me two hundred dollars in traveler's checks and told me to make it last. A day or two later, he flew back to the U.S. I found a companion for the trip, John Perongs, a dark-haired kid, three years older than I, sturdy and even-tempered and good with his hands. On June 21st, the summer solstice, I said goodbye to my girlfriend Erica, promising to send letters, and then John and I walked to the edge of town and hitched our first ride. By evening, we had made it to Stonehenge, where a group of long-haired druids were celebrating the moon cycle by chanting and dancing among the great stones. We stopped in Brussels to get Togolese visas before we continued south. Our destination was Marseille, where a passenger ferry crossed the Mediterranean to Algiers. I knew from obsessive reading of transportation timetables that we could catch a trans-Saharan bus from Algiers to Taman Rasset, an oasis town in the Ahagar mountain range. There was unrest in parts of Africa, as Portugal's forces fought independence movements in its colonies. But most of the northern part of the continent seemed safe enough to me. We'd pass through the desert into Niger and Upper Volta, and eventually we'd arrive in Togo. Anyone who passed me hitchhiking would have guessed my cultural leanings. I had long hair and a scraggly beard, and wore white bell bottoms that I'd painted with orange mushrooms. I opposed the Vietnam War, despised President Nixon, and distrusted the police. My Bibles were sole on ice. Steal this book, and the autobiography of Malcolm X, and my soundtrack was David Bowie, King Crimson, Jimi Hendrix, Santana. I'd been in London for one of Pink Floyd's first performances of *The Dark Side of the Moon*, and I'd gone to Amsterdam for an underground showing of the X-rated cartoon *Fritz the Cat*. At the same time, I nerdishly devoured the World Atlas, any ABC shipping guide I could get hold of, and the writings of adventurers like Henry Morton Stanley. Richard Francis Burton, and Martin and Osa Johnson. I told people I met to call me Sakui, a name I'd been given in a jungle hamlet I visited during my time in Liberia. The name I'd explain meant tall man in the Capella language. Back in Liberia, decades later, I learned that it was actually from a phrase meaning "the boy who arrived by surprise." From Brussels, John and I thumbed rides through Luxembourg and Germany. And on to Switzerland and France. Across the border from Geneva, we were left on a roadside at night, and a car pulled off to pick us up—a Citroen DS Shark, a gleaming gangster mobile with hydraulics that made it seem to levitate when you started the engine. The driver, a burly middle-aged man with a Russian accent, introduced himself as Parchovsky.
He was headed elsewhere, but when he heard our plans, he grandly declared that he would join our adventure as far as Marseille. We arrived just as dawn was breaking over the harbor, and Parchovsky insisted that we toast our success. He parked next to the wharf and led us to a bar, a rough-edged after-hours place. The only other customers were a prostitute, with a russet stain in the crotch of her white pants, and a tough-looking man with a shaved head, apparently her pimp. Parchovsky ordered beers and raised a glass. To Taman Rosset. Then he gave me a gitan cigarette to smoke in his name on African soil. With the sun bright in the sky, we lurched back to Parchovsky's car, congratulating one another on completing the first leg of the voyage. As we approached, we saw that the windows had been smashed, and the trunk was gaping open. Our backpacks were gone, my camera had been taken, and our passports too. As we looked around in shock, Parchovsky felt urgently under the dashboard. He had hidden some cash there, he explained, and now it was gone. Dazed by exhaustion and dismay, we drove through the empty streets searching for a police station. Little diamonds of shattered glass glistened on the dashboard, and the morning air blew in through the window frames. At the gendarme's base, a laconic officer took down the details of the robbery, seemingly oblivious of a large butcher knife that lay on his desk, dripping blood. Unable to contain my curiosity, I asked what it was. He explained that some Frenchman had stabbed a Moroccan— and that he was waiting to hear whether the victim survived. If he didn't, the knife would be evidence in a homicide. Afterward, Parchovsky went on his way, somewhat poorer, but still ebullient. There was no hope of our taking the Trans-Mediterranean ferry, not without passports, but the gendarme told us to check in every few days to see if our belongings had reappeared. A friend of a friend, Sylvie, had an apartment in the city, and she invited us to stay with her while we waited. Marseille had a reputation as a mafia town, and a heroine crossroads. The French connection had come out a couple of years earlier, and it wasn't hard to pick a fight. One day, seated next to Sylvie in traffic, I yelled a phrase that she had taught me at a taxi driver trying to outmaneuver us. C'est la guerre, cochon! This is war, pig. I managed to remove my elbow just before he brought an iron bar down on the open window sill. A few weeks later, we were notified that the police had found our belongings in a watery ditch at the edge of town. Miraculously, they had retrieved our passports, waterlogged but still legible. Almost everything else was gone. We checked again on the ferry to Algiers, but there was a new obstacle. A heavy Scirocco was blocking the Tamaraset Road. Too impatient to wait for it to clear, we decided to travel through Spain to Morocco and somehow get to Togo from there. I had been to Spain once before when my parents allowed me to go traveling over the previous summer break. I'd been reading about the Spanish Civil War, Orwell, Hemingway, and especially William Herrick, a former International Brigades member who wrote stirringly of idealistic volunteers marching into battle singing, Life is just a bowl of cherries. I knew that the idealists had lost, beaten by Francisco Franco with the aid of Hitler and Mussolini, but I was horrified to see that three and a half decades into his rule, virtually every place I visited in Spain had statues of Franco and avenues named in his honor. Hitchhiking in the Extremadura, I gathered the courage to ask a middle-aged Spaniard what he thought of Franco. Before risking an answer, he gave a furtive look over his shoulder. His gesture revealed more than his response. The Spanish had acceded to dictatorship out of fear. On this new journey, John and I headed for Cadiz, the port in southern Spain where Columbus had begun his second voyage. A weekly boat took passengers to the Canary Islands. According to my information, we could get another ship from there to La Yune, a mining port in the colony of Spanish Sahara, just south of Morocco. Arriving around nightfall, we found a place to sleep in the city park. To kill time, I proposed a challenge. I told John that I could jump from one side of a little bridge to the other. As I landed, I heard a sickening pop and felt pain shoot up my left leg. There was no way of getting to a doctor, but I must have torn my Achilles tendon. John helped me hop away, then cut tree branches to make me a crutch. I still have the crutch's arm braces, carved with tendon blues and Marseille. The boat to Las Palmas boarded the next day and as we settled into our cabin, the door opened and we found that we had a companion 
a young Moroccan named Baba, with curly hair, a wry face, and a street kid's spare build. For the next two days, he kept up a high-speed patter in broken English, like the dealer in a protracted game of three-card Monte. Not far out of port, he informed us that he was carrying some hashish, a serious risk because drug possession in Spain could get you a six-year prison term. Trying to keep pace with him, I got so stoned that I began to hallucinate and stumbled into the bathroom where I saw my face in the mirror revealed as a wizened death mask. I made myself a promise never to smoke hash again, and for a few years, I kept it. It was early morning when we docked in Las Palmas, and we had to wait for a control post run by the Guardia Civil to open before we could leave the port. The Guardia, when they showed up, were fearsome-looking figures, in paramilitary green uniforms, black leather boots, and the beaked black leather hats that their corps had worn since medieval times. They were hostile, and as I stood in line to have my passport checked, one of them kicked my injured leg, cursing me as a gilipollas and a maricón. Once our documents passed inspection, we were allowed through, but the Guardia had made it clear that we were not welcome in Las Palmas. We weren't worried. Surely, we thought, we'd be leaving for Africa within a few days. Geographically, the Canary Islands belong to Africa, not Europe, with the main island of Gran Canaria set only 150 miles from La Yune, but nearly 800 from Spain. The chain includes eight rugged volcanic islands with ideal soil for sugar and bananas. The Isleños, who didn't farm traditionally, eked out a living by fishing the Atlantic. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella had seized the islands in the 15th century, not long after taking Andalusia back from the Moors. The Canaries provided easy access to the trade winds, and Columbus began using them as his final stop for provisions before voyages west. The islands had been populated for a millennium by the Guanches, barbar people of northern African extraction. But in 1495, as the Spanish secured control, the last Guanche king threw himself off a cliff. Five hundred years later, the Canaries and the adjacent Saharan colony were practically all that remained of the Spanish Empire, which had been eroded by independence revolts and demolished by the Spanish-American War. In one summer of naval skirmishes, the despised Yankees stripped away the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Spain's colonial army was reduced to chasing barbar guerrillas around Morocco. It was in those obscure squabbles that Franco got his military start in the 20s. By 1936, he was the military commander of the Canary Islands, posted there by the left-leaning government in Madrid, which hoped to keep him at a safe distance from the capital. Instead, the island served as a superb base for plotting. That July, Franco boarded a chartered plane from Las Palmas to Morocco, where he and his fascist co-conspirators mustered the so-called Army of Africa and began marching north. Three years and 600,000 deaths later, he prevailed. By the mid-70s, the Generalissimo was elderly and ill, but he clung to power, while the Spanish people existed in a state of suspended animation. Despite a veneer of modernity along the coasts, where hotels and apartment buildings rose to accommodate tourists, inland Spain was not much changed from the 19th century. With Franco's secret police and the Catholic Church conspiring to keep society in check, censorship prevailed, and laws forbade homosexuality, abortion, contraception, and divorce. During the evenings, I watched girls and boys my age walk out in the plazas to cast secretive glances at one another, but stern chaperones kept them apart. Las Palmas sat on a peninsula, set off from the rest of the island by barren mountains. The whole city, a sun-blasted place of low, blunt, sand-colored buildings, pointed at the sea, with a military base on one side and a beach lined with tourist hotels on the other. When we arrived, we discovered that there was no passage to La Yune. Morocco and Spain were in conflict over the fate of the colony, and the boat was reserved for soldiers. Africa was just across the water, but there was no clear way to get there. I had eighty dollars worth of traveler's checks left. Since we were waiting for a boat, we decided that there was no better place to camp than the port, and we found a deserted concrete yard alongside the wharves, 
where commercial fishing nets were laid to dry. In some areas, the nets were bunched in mounds, offering hiding spots. It was a refuge that shielded us from view, but allowed us to keep watch on both the main port entrance and the closest city street. The nets were like an islet that shipwrecked sailors swam to, and then, depending on their luck, were either rescued or figured out how to survive. Before long, a small group of us had coalesced there. There was Baba, the Moroccan who had come with us on the boat, and Najir, a friend of his. There was also a Ghanaian named Brando, who claimed to be a prince in exile. We never knew whose story was true, and mostly, we didn't ask. A Malaysian boy named Pili was on the nets when we arrived. He was thin, barely five feet tall, funny and engaging and bright. He had learned passable Spanish in just two months in Las Palmas. He told us that he was from a coastal village on the Malay Peninsula, where commercial fishing fleets came to force young men into servitude. After more than a year in virtual slavery, Pili had escaped in Las Palmas when the ship's officers went into the city, leaving the crew for days without food. Years later, human rights investigations confirmed the kidnappings that Pili had described, but other visitors' stories were harder to verify. Hassan, a charming, sophisticated Lebanese man in his late twenties, turned up on the nets wearing a conspicuously expensive leather jacket. As we lay there one night, stargazing and trading stories, he told us that he was a card sharp, trained by a man who lived in a citadel in the Lebanese mountains, a gambler so skilled that he had been banned from casinos around the world. After a long apprenticeship, Hassan said, his mentor had pronounced him ready to go practice what he had learned. He'd headed to Monte Carlo, where on his first night he won $50,000 at poker. The next evening, when he returned to the casino, heavies ushered him into a back room and warned that if he didn't leave town, they would cut off all his fingers. Now Hassan was stuck in Las Palmas like the rest of us, trying to figure out his next move. But he was cavalier. Don't worry. One day soon I'll be out of here and back on my feet. Hassan stayed a few days before he vanished. Then, several weeks later, I was standing on the avenue in front of the port when someone called out from a car. It was Hassan, at the wheel of a Mercedes, smiling and waving. I waved back, then the traffic moved and he sped off. I never saw him again. Las Palmas was an attractive place for international intriguers, wayward sailors, hippies carrying paperbacks by Paul Bowles, and mercenaries on R&R. &R. One of these fighters was a giant Finn with a red beard, too persistently drunk for me to find out where he was stationed, though I guessed it was Rhodesia, where the so-called Bush War was being fought between white settlers and black nationalist guerrillas. Another... A Spaniard, who called himself Fidel, joined us on the fishing nets for a few nights. He hinted at being involved in clandestine political maneuvers, perhaps with the Canaries separatist movement, which a few years later planted a bomb at the local airport, leading to a devastating collision between two 747s. Sleeping on the nets had risks. Dogs ran wild there, and one night a bitch in heat began following me until a pack of males— evidently mistaking me for competition, backed me away from her, growling. There were thieves, too, and I once woke up to find that my backpack had been opened, its contents strewn around, though the thief must have quickly realized that I had nothing of value to take. The most persistent threat was the Guardia Civil. At dawn one morning, we were awakened by the screech of a patrol wagon pulling up next to us. A half-dozen officers jumped out and began swinging nightsticks at everyone they could reach, but their real targets were the two Moroccans, Najir and Baba, whom they quickly surrounded, viciously beat, and then hurled into the patrol wagon to be detained for a month on what we later discovered were charges of vagrancy. We began setting lookouts for the Guardia at night, but it was harder to avoid patrols in the street. Not long after Najir and Baba were arrested, Pili vanished too. Several weeks later, I encountered him walking along a road. I called out, but he seemed to barely recognize me and was speaking gibberish. Afterward, I heard that the Guardia had beaten him so badly that he lost his mind. During the day, we all went our separate ways. John and I usually headed for a fountain in a plaza across from an ancient church where travelers gathered. 
For young foreigners contending with Spain's repressive society and strict laws, the plaza served as a node in a bush telegraph, a place to exchange survival tips, warnings of risk, and rules of the road. Yet when John and I asked people we met there how we might get to Togo, no one knew anything. We discussed going back the way we had come, traveling the length of Spain to catch a boat in Marseille, but with our shrunken funds and me on a crutch, it seemed implausible. Besides, we had come so far. After a few days, a German traveler named Pavel, a strongly built kid with long blonde hair, told us that he knew of a ship sailing in a couple of weeks to the former Spanish colony of Equatorial Guinea. From there, Togo was tantalizingly close, just a couple of countries away along the West African coast. Pavel was planning to go on the ship. Did we want to join him? We did. We would need visas, and so he offered to mail our passports, along with his, to the Embassy of Equatorial Guinea in Madrid. There was a fee of twenty dollars. The process should take a week or so. John and I handed Pavel our passports and the cash. We felt buoyed. Just like that, we had discovered an exciting route to Togo. Pavel had started out on the nets but found a way off. He was living with a Spanish widow in a luxury apartment overlooking the main beach. We joked that he was basically a gigolo, and he laughed but didn't deny it. Once or twice he showed up at the fountain with the woman who kept him off the streets, attractive, fortyish, clearly amused by his company. The rest of us, with no means of support, spent our days by the fountain and our evenings at El Rayo, a cheap restaurant on a promenade not far from the port. It was a long, cavernous place with harried waiters who hustled plates of food and barked out orders to the kitchen. The head waiter was a stocky man with greased hair and a walleye, and he delighted in ignoring our table because we were too poor to afford anything more than the cheapest plate on the menu, fried grouper, accompanied by all the bread and olive oil we could get. The table next to us was often occupied by a group of trans women, who were resting up in Las Palmas between operations at the world's first gender reassignment clinic in Casablanca. One of them, bearded and exuberant, liked to show off her breasts in a fishnet shirt. At the neighboring tables, portside locals shared space with downbeat travelers from both sides of the Mediterranean. One evening, we sat next to a German man with a graying goatee, a foreman at a South African diamond mine on vacation in the Canaries. In between calls for more liquor, he complained loudly about the African workers he supervised, calling them lazy and stupid. Finally, I lost patience and lunged at him, until my Ghanaian friend Brando pulled me off and dragged me from the restaurant. Outside, he explained that the stakes of getting in trouble were different for him. I might get roughed up by the Guardia, but he could be deported. Weeks went by, and Pavel received no word on our visas, until eventually the ship to Equatorial Guinea set sail without us. Without thinking about it much, I stopped communicating with my family. It had become a point of pride to extricate myself from my situation, and in any case there was no way to reach them by phone. The only option was post restant, a system by which travelers sent and received letters at post offices around the world. I'd mailed a card to a friend in Lyme Regis, telling him that I'd arrived in Las Palmas, but nothing more. As time went on, I entered my own bubble, living at the port and on the streets, with my head full of plans. Hanging out at the fountain, I sometimes saw a tall, muscular Austrian with a shaved head and a forbidding manner. A friend who knew him told me that he had been born on a junk in Hong Kong and spent his entire life at sea. He was a former opium addict, a tormented soul, my friend said. He had lost his boat somehow and was frantic to get another one. The Austrian used to lurk at the edge of the square with his wife, a Vietnamese woman with long black hair. One day they vanished and were missing for half a week before I heard news of them. In the grip of a malarial fever, he had stolen a rowboat, forced his wife aboard, and set out to row to Morocco. They were lucky to have been rescued by a passing ship before they reached the coast. Cape Juby, the point where he was headed, is a wall of hundred-foot cliffs, and the seas there had been known since antiquity to swallow up boats and their crews. The Austrian had been reckless, but I couldn't help noticing that he had nearly made it to the coast.' 
I began scouting ships in the Las Palmas wharves, where the better-off travelers docked. The one I coveted most was a turn-of-the-century schooner, with the name Marte, in carved gold braiding across the stern. She was a hundred and ten feet long, with three towering masts and a hold big enough to fit a family of elephants. I visited her every day, walking on her decks and fantasizing about sailing her around the world. Some of the boaties sensed my yearning, and one of them mentioned that he had a sailboat anchored on the neighboring island of Tenerife. If I wanted to go take possession, she was mine. I cashed in one of my dwindling supply of traveler's checks to pay for the ferry, then hitchhiked and walked across the island, and by early morning I had made it to the marina. I walked back and forth along the piers, looking for the number of the mooring the yachtsman had given me, but when I reached it, there was an empty space. A marina employee finally explained, The sailboat had been sunk a few days before, he told me, pointing into the waters of the harbor. The suspicion was that she had been scuttled, something to do with insurance claims. I returned to Las Palmas feeling distraught. All my plans had been thwarted. Increasingly desperate, I began to ponder joining the Spanish Foreign Legion. I had few illusions about what the Legion stood for, but I'd seen legionnaires gathered at a garrison near the port, and I'd learned that a unit called the Nomad Troops patrolled the Spanish Sahara on camelback. If I joined up, I could become familiar with the desert, pick up some Arabic, and learn enough about camels to make my way alone into the Sahara. I'd enlist, spend six months or a year in the nomad troops, and then escape. Even John, who had willingly come with me to the Canaries, thought that this plan was absurd. One day he interrupted my reveries to tell me that he'd found a sailboat. It needed work, but we could buy it for the sixty dollars I had remaining in traveler's checks and then figure out how to repair it. I went to see her on a small beach not far from the port where she sat in dry dock, cradled on a metal platform with a ladder. She was a traditional Canaries racer, a lateen-sailed, deep-keeled boat about twenty feet long. The keel was rotten and needed to be completely rebuilt. What sat on the platform was really just a hull with a mast. Even so, it gave material shape to the possibility of escape. I suggested that we call her Guanarteme II, the name I'd been told of the last Guanche king who had leaped to his death rather than submit to the Spaniards. I learned later that Guanarteme was actually an infamous traitor who had sold his people out to the occupiers. We scrounged for wood and tools and built ourselves crude bunks in the hull. When they were ready, we moved off the fishing nets and began sleeping on the boat. The beach was a grubby rectangle of sand set beneath an elevated highway and a row of street lamps that shone down on us at night. But on our platform we were mostly invisible to people on the ground. It was as if we were already at sea. To fix the keel we'd need to replace planks, caulk the gaps with twine and silicone paste, then sand and waterproof the whole surface and coat it in paint. We were sure we could do it with help from local sailors and boat builders. Not far from the water's edge stood a chiringuito, a rustic beach bar. Soon after we arrived, I poked my head in to meet the patrons. A grizzled man sized up my blonde hair and growled, Fuera sueco. Beat it, Swede. Later, the bar's owner came by to apologize. He was a bruiser named Pedro, a former weightlifting champion who kept a gold medal around his neck to prove it. He wore little bikini briefs and no shirt exposing a huge chest and belly and an array of crude tattoos, including one dedicated to his mother. Pedro lived in a large tent pitched in the sand, and he invited us there for dinner, stew that he had cooked in a fire pit outside. After that, whenever he emerged from his tent, he'd wave and call us over. We'd wave back, but we were leery of his stews and of the rough men who went to drink at his bar. Each morning, John and I split up, hoping to find work that would pay for food and materials. In my search, I heard about an English-language academy, the Instituto Inglés, which might need a teaching assistant. It was an hour's walk away, on the outskirts of Las Palmas, but by now I was off my crutch, and there was the prospect of a job. The director of the Instituto turned out to be a bombastic character with wild, frizzy hair and an astrakhan cap whom everyone called Professor Reina. As soon as we met, he began boasting of the languages he spoke, 
Chinese, Russian, a dozen others, and recounting a meeting he'd once had with Winston Churchill. He had traveled all over the world, he said, and now he was home, teaching English to young canarios. His method was to deploy songs from the sound of music. I sat in on a class listening to him sing Do Re Mi, and the students dutifully sing it back to him. Most Spaniards, outside of tourist enclaves, were rarely exposed to English. There were no subtitled movies in Franco's Spain. Reina told me that I could come back in the morning and help the students practice their pronunciation. Famished and far away from my part of town, I decided to spend the night nearby to make sure I arrived on time. I had noticed a pile of concrete pipes next to the coastal road, part of an infrastructure project. I made my way there, crawled into one of the pipes, and slept. I worked for Reina the entire next day, and at the end, he invited me to eat with him, my first food in days. He bustled around his little kitchen and then set out dinner, two cups of chamomile tea and a single bowl of soup with two spoons. As we ate, he informed me that the soup was my pay. After another hungry night in a concrete pipe, I left in the morning furious and increasingly worried about how we would earn enough to fix our ship. I heard about a village down the coast, the last place in Spain where fishermen went to sea in open boats to harpoon tuna. John and I spent most of a day hitchhiking there, arrived at nightfall on the village's outskirts, and slept among the stalks at a sugar plantation. In the morning, we walked into the village to ask if there were jobs on the boats. It was the wrong season, we were told. The tuna wouldn't be running for six months. Back on the wharves, I went hungry much of the time. Like other castaways, John often panhandled in the city. I sometimes did too, but it felt humiliating to accost local people. ¿Tienes un duro para comer? Every few days a matronly Spanish woman appeared at the fountain to give me a plastic bag with bananas and bread, and sometimes little packets of butter and jam. It was a kind of ritual. She handed me the bag in silence, and I thanked her as she walked away. Sometimes, as I shared the food with other regulars at the fountain, they asked why she only ever came to me. I didn't know why. My Spanish was rudimentary in those days, and her English non-existent, but I considered her a kind of guardian angel. Once, she motioned for me to follow her, and we walked through the streets to a small house. Inside, a tiny elderly woman was waiting, the banana lady's mother. They pointed to a shower room and some fresh clothes laid out nearby. It was my first shower in months. Until then, to clean myself, I had gone into the sea. There seemed to be no work for me in Las Palmas, so I inquired about jobs on fishing trawlers. At one grubby vessel, a Sicilian trawler, crewmen invited me into their mess and gave me a meal. They told me they would be putting out to sea soon for a two-month stint of fishing. Did I want to join them? I came away hopeful, if a little perplexed about why they were so eager to hire me. But when I consulted Brando about my offer, he was vehement. Don't do it, he said explaining that the Sicilians wanted me as a cabin boy to have sex with. The same thing had happened to him on the ship he had taken out of Ghana, and he had been forced to defend himself with a knife. That was the reason he had jumped ship in Las Palmas, he said. I was bitterly disappointed, but I knew he was telling the truth. Najir and Baba offered a last-ditch alternative. Since getting out of jail, they had moved around Las Palmas, eluding the Guardia and finding ways to survive. Najir sold porn films, which were illegal in Spain, and he confided a lucrative hustle. Other times, they picked pockets in the streets, usually targeting unwary tourists, who would be counted on to be carrying cash. They offered to show me their techniques, which turned out to be rudimentary, but effective. You sidle up alongside your mark, dip your hand in his pocket, and run. The key, they said, was to keep your nerve at the crucial moment. One day at the fountain, a drunk middle-aged man came up and leeringly propositioned me, pulling a wad of pesetas from his jacket pocket and waving it in the air. I told him to get lost, but I couldn't help noticing the amount of money he'd flashed. Enough to fix Guanarteme II and get off the island. Najir and Baba, hovering nearby, had noticed the exchange. As the man stumbled off, they drew my attention with a furtive signal, pulling down an eyelid with a finger 
and motioned me over. This, they said, could be my first test as a pickpocket. Like a pack of scrawny jackals, we followed the drunk man onto a nearby shopping street. For several blocks, Najir and Baba guided me by sign language, encouraging me to get just behind him, matching his pace. When I was alongside, I could see where he kept his cash, in a right-hand blazer pocket that hung open as he walked. All I had to do was take the money and flee. Trailing on either side, Najir and Baba silently urged me on, but just then I hesitated, feeling sure that everyone on the street could see me. In a moment, the drunk man had moved out of range. Najir and Baba gestured to me to fall back. We'd have a second chance, they said. I just had to keep my cool. We tracked the man through the streets until he stopped near a group of teenagers lounging in front of a building. As we watched from a block away, he again pulled cash from his pocket. In an instant, one of the boys grabbed the money and the whole group bolted down a side street. We chased them, yelling that they had stolen our mark and needed to share the take, but they were too fast for us. In a few blocks, the boys and the money had disappeared. By late October, it had been four months since I left England, and nothing had worked out. Sores had opened on my fingers and in the corners of my mouth. One day, Pavel found me and John and handed us our missing passports. They had returned from the Embassy of Equatorial Guinea with no stamps and no explanation. We were back where we had started. John began looking for a way to get home. One of the wanderers in Las Palmas, a girl named Maya, had gone to the British consulate and asked to be repatriated. The foreign office had agreed to loan her the cost of return passage. When John told me that he wanted to follow her example... I said that I understood, and went with him to the consulate on an upper floor of a commercial building. I was barefoot and dirty, but the diplomats welcomed us kindly. After the consul learned that I was an American citizen, he suggested that the U.S. consulate might be able to do something for me. Until that moment, it had never occurred to me to seek help from the U.S. government. As details had poured out about the Watergate scandal and about the conduct of the war in Vietnam— I had felt ashamed to carry an American passport. But the diplomats reassured me, saying that there was no obligation if I stopped in. When I walked into the U.S. consulate and identified myself, the consul made an astonished noise and asked me to sit down. He opened a cabinet and pulled out a file with my name on it. I felt a terrible jolt as I leafed through it. Inside, were dozens of telegrams and letters that my parents had sent to consulates and embassies across the region, asking if they knew anything of my whereabouts. They were accompanied by official responses in which diplomats told my parents that they had checked with this prison or that hospital and found no trace of me. The consul looked at me scoldingly, but he was gracious enough not to say anything. I felt mortified by the evidence of the anxiety I'd put my parents through. I was in a state of shock, unsure what to think or do, but I told the consul that I would come back soon. The next day I accompanied John to the British consulate again. I was chatting with him and the consul when I saw someone come up the stairs, a familiar figure but confoundingly out of place. It was my sister, Michelle. We both shouted with delight and embraced each other. How on earth had she found me? Michelle explained that after her Togo expedition ended... She had spent a few months in Ghana, living at the Accra YWCA. She had a vague idea that I would be making my way to Africa, but she wasn't too worried until a letter arrived from our father. There had been no word from me for months. Would she go track me down? She'd come to Las Palmas intending to spend a few days, maybe a week, scouting around. She'd sat all day in a cafe in the main plaza, watching out for me, but there were hundreds of people passing through and she'd ended the night with no leads. The British consulate was the next place she tried. It seemed almost too easy, she told me, as if we'd had an appointment to meet in the specific place. Everything happened fast after that. Michelle booked me into the small hotel where she was staying and bought me some clothes. A few days later, I flew to New York and on to Florida. Within three days of leaving Guanarteme II, I was at my mother's new home in Gainesville. Tina and May Sean were there with her, and so was Scott, back from his road trip with her father. Michelle would arrive soon after a stop in France. 
We were together again, but it was clear that things wouldn't be the same as before. My parents had separated and would soon be divorced. My father was living two hours away on the Florida coast with an American woman he had met in Nepal. For several uneasy weeks, I didn't know what to do with myself. I got a haircut, and my father took me to a doctor who ran some tests. He informed me that I had amoebas and worms, along with an ailment that he had only read about before, scurvy. You mean like Christopher Columbus's sailors? I asked. He nodded. I felt very proud. By early December, I was on the road again, with a man I knew as Uncle Don, a family friend from when we lived in Colombia. He had bought some oceanfront land in Honduras, in a remote stretch of jungle near a village called Sambo Creek, and he'd asked if I would come help him build a house there. Everyone agreed that it was the perfect solution for me. I was happy to go. That was The Long Way, written by John Lee Anderson for The New Yorker 